And that's the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me God. Amen. <laughs> Amen. It is so good to be here today and good to see you. Uh, God has blessed us. Amen. And so it's, it's good to be a part of a church that loves Jesus and is praising the Lord and moving forward. Let me just brag a little bit, by the way. Y'all like being patted on the back a little bit, right? Uh, this last Easter was probably one of the best Easter services and uh, of attendance we've ever recorded in our church services at any time. It wasn't just a spike. Of, you know, at both campuses, as a matter of fact, we had over 100 percent increase in the attendance for the services. So go ahead and give yourself praise the Lord. All that work, inviting people, encouraging people and getting ready and ushering two services and all that stuff. It all pays off in touching people's lives. And I can't thank you participating. If you hadn't got a proper pat on the back, there it is. Receive it well. And I, I can't thank you enough for doing what you did to honor the Lord in, in, in such a fashion, in such a way, because if we're going to do what God's called us to do, doing it. Amen? amen. I say amen. amen. In fact, you know, it is good, by the way, to step back and look and see what God's doing. But sometimes I can get frustrated with myself because I don't feel like maybe I'm getting far enough down the road or maturing as much as in some area I want to mature. Or, you know, feel like you just you ever get to the point where you feel like, oh, well, what's the use? I'm really struggling here. But, you know, take a moment. All right. Take a chill pill. I'm not telling you where you are. I want you to keep moving forward. We'll talk about that. But let's just remember how good and faithful that God has been. You know, it's good to do that in your marriage. It's good to do it in your family settings. It's good to do it in your life. Because it's easy to get frustrated with yourself at times before and seeking, you know, to, to, to be what God's called you to be. You remember that you have an enemy, by the way, and he's the one that's always whispering in your ear. You're sorry. You're no good. He's not going to work. You're not going to make it. You want to use all that comes straight out of hell. Amen. Or from our, even our own nature. We're not really very self-encouraging in that regard. So I want you to step back just for a moment. Just think about all that God's done, all that God's doing in your life. Maybe if you're working some area in the ministry of church, sometimes it gets frustrating and serving the Lord. But hey, look at all the Lord's done. I mean, look how many lives have been touched. Look how many reached. Look how many hearts are being touched. Let's remember what God's doing. I, I shared with our men at our men's the other night just briefly. I said I was talking to some folks that uh, they run about a thousand on an average in their church, and they just had their men's retreat. You know, and he said, "How did y'all go?" I said, "I went great." I said, we, "You know, we had really had a good turnout. Had seventy plus men." And he said, "How big was your church?" And I told him, he says. He said, we, and we run a thousand. So it's good to realize God's doing some things. Amen. <laughs> and one thing I've always been impressed with is, you know, is, is the depth of people of, and the depth of people's commitment around here. So, you know, keep moving forward. Keep believing God. Keep trusting God in your own life. When you see those areas of frustration, it is good to take a moment to stand back and just see, hey, uh, if there are some areas, obviously, that God's always working in all our lives, that's good to know. We got where we are by the grace of God. You're going to get through where you're at by the grace of God. You're going to get through what you're dealing with by the grace of God. God's going to carry you through whatever it is. And so you trust him and you hold on to him and you believe. And in that, you'll see God move and do some glorious things in your life. So don't get too frustrated. Let's look and see what, where the Lord's brought us. You know, it's, it's the old saying, you know, uh, uh, I'm, not, you know, I'm not where I need to be, but praise God, I'm not what I used to be. And so there's always that, that promise. I want to talk to you about uh, kind of following up in our spiritual walk in lives. And uh, is this cutting in and out of my imagination? Well, stop it. I'm going to move it down a little bit here. What's that mean? Does that mean draw it out or click the clicker? Well, whose fault is that? I just, I just work here. I'm not the mechanic. I reset. It's fine. Maybe it's me. I just talked about not complaining. Let's praise the Lord a little bit. Some people just can't please me. How about the, this? Is this working? This, this not working either? Boy, y'all just going in for a load today, man. I don't have to be bound by anything now. No PowerPoint to hold me back. Amen. So let's have church. I want you to open your Bible with me while you're going there. Let me just share a few things about our passage and text of scripture that I'll be sharing with you today. It's from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 
And in that passage, the apostle is talking to the church of Corinth about going forward. He's talking about problems within the church. And the Corinthian church had a lot of issues, by the way. Praise God. We don't have as many as they had. We got our own. But hey, they had a, a multitude. And so he's writing them this letter. And he says, I want you to remember, you know, the Old Testament illustrations and examples we had. And he brought up the children of Israel in the wilderness. And he made reference to that. And he talked about how God was not pleased with those people. And they literally just laid low. There's no point in our spiritual walk in life that we need to settle down and get laid low. You know, as I said a while ago, we need to press on. We need to move forward what God is doing in our lives and what God is speaking to our life and how God is working in our lives. So I, I want to be, and I believe majority of you also, want to be all that God desires for you to be. You want to experience the grace of God in your life. You want to experience Jesus in a very real way. And you want to experience the reality of his power in your life. Last Sunday, we closed by talking about that experiencing the Easter power in our lives because the resurrection power of Jesus Christ is for us today so we can live a resurrected life as well. So we can experience the newness of life. Paul said in Romans that we've been buried with him in baptism. So we, 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 we died to the old man and we've been raised to walk in a new life. How are we going to experience that in our walk in life? But even more so today, how do we experience that resurrection power in our church? Because you remember we closed with that point last week about the importance of the bride of Christ and if Jesus is risen and if we're going to experience the fullness of Jesus in our life, we need to, we need to be a part of what he died. The Bible says he died for the church and we, he died for his bride. We are that bride. So we need to experience the fullness of that. It would be a terrible thing in your marriage. You'll never enjoy marriage until, you know, you realize there's a relationship going on. It's not just about you. And it's the same thing in the church and our relationship with Jesus is not just about us. It's about our relationship with him and about our relationship with each other. Paul's telling the Christians, you know, hey, guys, it's not just about you. This passage, can you stand with me and let's honor the reading of the word this morning. In 1 Corinthians 10, read verses 1 through 7. He says, for I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and they all passed through the sea. That's the Red Sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and they all ate the same spiritual food. Now he's talking about it's the church today. We've all experienced the same thing in Jesus Christ. All right. Just like the congregation of Israel all experienced those things under Moses. But he says they drank the same spiritual drink for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed him. And that was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased for they were laid low in the wilderness and these things happened to them as examples for us that we should not crave evil things as they also craved. And do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, those people sat down to eat and they drink and they rose up to play. And God bless the reading of the word. You may be seated. There's about five things I want to pull from this experience of the children of Israel in the wilderness and what they, what they went through and what they had to deal with while they were in the wilderness. It wasn't God's will for them to stay there. Unfortunately, that whole generation, the first generation that came out of Egypt, never got into the promised land except Joshua and Caleb. Now, if you follow the story, and some of you hadn't read the book, you saw the movie, so you got the gist of it, right? <laughs> Just got through Easter, they showed it again. So it ought to be fresh on your mind. But as you go through the story, it says that they were laid low in the wilderness and God was not pleased with them. They'd all had this experience. They'd all been delivered. They'd all gone through the Red Sea together. They'd all, you know, experienced the glory of God and the cloud that settled in the Shekinah glory of God. They had all those experiences, but with many and with most of them, God was not well pleased. I don't want to be that person, nor do we want to be that church. I don't think you want to be that person. When it steps back and what's the opinion of God about my life? I want to know that my life is pleasing to God. That's really the bottom line of our relationship, that we would please the Lord, that we would honor our relationship and we would honor him in our relationship. And so we want to know how to do that effectively. But there are five things I think that you can look at these people and see what they were and what we ought to be. It's kind of that the flip side of it. He says, first of all, in this, this one verse, he says, uh, he says in verse seven, don't be idolaters more as it's written that people sit down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Point number one is we are not deserters. We are not idolaters. We're not turning our back on the Lord. We're disciples. And you need to mark that down. What God's called you to be settle in right now. You're not a deserter. There's no place for turning back. It's, just, it's it, from the moment I give my life to Jesus. It's forward from here. We all know of too many people who started in their life in the relationship with Jesus Christ, went so far and then bailed out. 
The children of Israel, many of them, in fact, 20 some thousand of them lost their life in one day because of this idolatrous act that the scripture is talking about in this specific place. You remember the story? Worship the golden calf, and they began to commit immorality and adulterous acts within the ranks of the, of the whole assembly. And it says, Many of them God was not pleased. I don't want us at any point to move from one place to another, from a place of righteousness, walking with God, to a place of immorality, to a place of not serving the Lord. You know, Jesus said, If you're not for me, you're what? So in other words, if, if, I'm, not, if I'm not following, then, then it doesn't matter. And last week I mentioned the fact that all too often in the modern church day that we live in, we don't have a lot of followers of Jesus. We have, we have fans. And we're, we're trying to build a fan base at church. But we don't need to build a fan base. I mean, we need to build a followers base. And the followers are these people who realize that Jesus Christ just come for us to experience a, a little salvation experience and our lives not be affected or changed or not affect anybody else's lives. We're following Jesus. And if we're going to be what God's called us to be as a church, if you're going to be what God's called you to be as an individual in the church and experience the power of God in your life to say, hey, I'm on board. I'm following the Lord and this is about him and it's about his will and it's about his church. We are his bride. The Bible says, as we said last week in Ephesians, that Jesus died for the church. Amen. If he died for the church, then it's all, it should be up to us to live for the church. And to live and experience what God put in place in these last days to reach the lost world. What was that? That was the church. God has a plan for the church. And the church is here as, as the mission, the extension, the ministry, the body of Jesus. As though Jesus has gone, he's here. He's here in his church. And we're functioning as a body to be everything that God called us to be in this body. So it requires us to move forward. Now, I've talked to people like you have, and they sometimes when you ask them about where they go, well, I don't really go to church anymore, or maybe occasionally. That's not the biblical norm, okay? If you're a Christian, that's not the norm. Well, I come every once in a while. That's not the norm. The Bible says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Very clear that we fellowship together, we worship together, we spend time together. First day of the week, the scriptures record. They came together, they worshiped the Lord together, they studied the word of God together. That's who we are, amen? That's what we do, because we're the bride of Christ. That's the word of God. This is the way we live our lives, it's not part time, we're all on board. But I've talked to people, not only have they said, well, I don't really go to church. If you dig a little bit, they'll say something like this. Well, the church hurt me. You've heard that, right? The church did not hurt you. People may have hurt you. People who are in the church may have hurt you. But the church never going to hurt you. Church is good for you, all right? Church is where we live and move and operate and carry so many of our spiritual gifts and activities are carried out in this fellowship and out through this church into the world. People hurt people. I mean, that's as silly to, think, to say something like that is to go down here to one of the banks and have a bad experience with a teller and walk out there and tell all your friends, well, that bank hurt me. No, some teller who didn't, wasn't well-trained probably hurt you. <laughs> some person, you know, it's like going to the gym, you know, hurt my back. Well, the gym hurt me. <laughs> the gym, gym ruined my life, you know. Let's get real. The church is here for your your blessing for your security. And it's here for you to exercise the gifts that God's given you to exercise. The church is a blessing from God. And it's something that every one of our lives should be committed to. There's no place for us to be semi-committed in the church of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is his means, which he carries out his mission and his ministry to the world. Get in, get on board, get moving forward. We're, we're not deserters, we're what? We're disciples. The second point from this I want you to catch is, we are winners. We're not whiners. If you follow the story that Paul's giving reference to in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he's making reference to those people who had such division. In fact, he carries it on out into chapter 10 and also into chapter 11, talking about division and strife and disunity within the body of Christ. The reference to the Old Testament is all those people led by a man named Korah who gave Moses fits, all right? If you follow the story, remember that Korah was there and he was part of what they called the mixed multitude, all right? In other words, everybody that came out of Egypt, not all of them were, the, were children of Israel. They, the others just got on board and came with family members or whatever it might have been, gotten married into something, and they're out there. But there's many there who were just called that mixed multitude, as well as the children of Israel who followed some of those people, 
All right. Like Korah. Korah had been in leadership in the world system under Egypt's reign. And now he's been demoted and he's got to come under somebody else's leadership under God's leadership, which was Moses and Aaron. Moses, the leader and the prophet to the people and Aaron and the priesthood. Well, Korah, he didn't like this. You know, and so he starts causing trouble and he starts creating this whole spirit of, of, of what, the, what, the, what the Bible uses the word. They murmured. I use the word whine. It can kind of be the same thing. Amen. Amen. We're not whiners. We're winners. As soon as we start whining, guess what? We're no, we're no longer winners. In fact, the Bible has so much to say. It's incredible the amount of scriptures we could pile up that talk about the power of our words, whether they're positive words or they're negative words. And how that more that we fill our hearts and our mouths with words that are not positive, but they're negative terms and murmuring and negative words, what happens? He says in in verse 10, it says that they were destroyed. In other words, what comes out of our mouth, James put it this way, is either a blessing or it's a curse. I'm not talking about profanity, that's cursing in in the common vernacular today, but curse means to say something negative against someone or something. And all too often people, especially in church, can get into that that mindset of of murmuring as it was in in the children of Israel. So in verse 10 he says, don't grumble as they did. Don't grumble as they did because they were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, if you go back and spend a little time in this passage, In Exodus, where all this is going on, in Exodus uh, chapter 16 and also in Numbers, you see another occasion where they're all grumbling about stuff and murmuring about stuff. There was one guy who's kind of at the head of all this. We said his name was Korah. You know what Korah means in the Hebrew language? It just means to make bald. In other words, these kind of people, they make you pull your hair out. (laughs) That's my definition of that. But I think it's certainly accurate. Amen. You've been just negative about everything. There's nothing positive. Now they see it, but they don't talk about it because they're too busy talking about what's wrong. And they're just negative. Listen, Exodus 16, it says, this is the Lord speaking. In the morning, you shall see the glory of the Lord. For he that hears you is against the Lord. And what are we, yet you murmur against us. Verse 8, he goes on to say, and Moses said, this shall be that when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat and in the morning bread to the full. For the Lord hears your murmurings, which you murmur against him. And what are we? For your murmurings are not against us. We're against the Lord. So when you complain about stuff, you're complaining against the Lord. Well, no, I'm not. I'm complaining against Brother Gary. I didn't like why he did something. Or I'm complaining against so-and-so. Or I'm complaining against my wife or husband. He said, listen, you're just, you're, you need to see the big picture here. Basically, why didn't God change your husband? Why didn't God change your situation? Why didn't God change that? So ultimately, you start murmuring against things. You, you got to trust the Lord. You got to realize that God's a big God. It's time to quit your whining. I mean, uh, praise the Lord. Our church, for the most part, didn't like this. But there are times with some church members, I want to hand out some diapers. Amen. And and they need them because they're making a mess of the one they got. Spiritually speaking, obviously. All right. These people, if you follow this right, they complained about food. We want garlic. We want leeks. We want onions. They complained about the impossible odds of the promised land and numbers. They all come back after they sent 12 spies out. Remember the story? How 10 came back with a very positive, uh, with a very negative report. Two came back with a positive report. 10 came back. They said, no way. We can't do it. They're, we're outnumbered. And the people, not, not only outnumbered, there's giants. On this. These people are bigger than we are. And they, not only that, they have walled cities. And they're just complaining. Oh, it's so hard. It's not going to work. There's no way. We're outnumbered. It's not a fair fight. It's unequal. Joshua and Caleb stood up and said, don't listen to that report. Yeah, there are, those things are true. But those are the very things that God's going to give us. He's going to give us those walled cities. And those giants, they're just bread for us. In other words, all those difficulties that you're complaining about, God wants to use those very things to make you fat spiritually. All right? To increase you, to grow you, to mature you. But all too often, our maturity is expressed very clearly. See, how, how's it expressed? By what comes out our mouth. If you're the kind of person who sees everything wrong with everything, then you're showing how immature you are. You're, sh- you're showing, hey, there's somewhere that God's allowed you to see those things, not for you to express your negative opinion, but for you to do something, to make a difference, to be a part of something, to build up something, not to whine about it. They complained about the, the impossible odds. They whined about the leadership of Aaron. Who do you think you are? Who put you in charge? Well, God. <laughs> they didn't like the fact of the priesthood. They didn't like the fact, well, Aaron and the Levites, how come they get to be the only ones? Be? That's just not fair. Well, it wasn't up to Aaron to make that decision, nor Moses. It was God's decision. 
God's the one who put those people there. God's the one. They complained. Remember Job? You know, I mean, Jonah, after he got spit up by the well, you'd think he'd learned his lesson. He gets up to Nineveh and he's got a terrible attitude and he's whining, complaining. In fact, he's out there and he just sits on the edge of the city. And so God grows him a little nice vine to give him some shade. Next morning, the shade tree dies and he whines about that. Just, just nothing can be right with some individuals. You know, nothing can just... Job, Jonah's problem was, I don't think he really wanted to see the revival break loose. You know, I think, and I, he didn't want to see revival, not because he was bigoted against those people. That's what some people preach. I think it's because he loved the people of God and he knows that maybe if Nineveh rises, that Israel may be come under assault in, time, in future days. So it was a protection for his own people, but still it was whining and it was whining against what God wanted to do and what God's will was. And unfortunately, that, that gets into our, our life, into our hearts. It's a hard thing to dispel because it becomes a, a lifestyle. And then no, all of a sudden, we're not happy. It's like the, the prodigal son. His brothers come home. His wayward brother repents. And the, there's a party going on. And he gets upset that his brothers repented because he didn't, never had a family killed for him. Daddy never threw a party for me. Dad's saying, your brother who was lost is now found. You don't get it. You don't see that. He's too busy. He's, his eyes are focused upon himself. What he wants, how he thinks it ought to work, and how he thinks it ought to run. I tell you, like I say, for the most part, praise the Lord. Our church isn't like that. You say, well, then why you preach on it? So we won't be like that. <laughs> you know, I grew up in churches like that. It was just, you know, every business meeting was just like a war zone. Just whining about stuff and complaining. Jesus, the Pharisees, they whined about Jesus eating with sinners. They whined about Jesus healing people. They whined about the miracles. They whined about when he said, I'm the bread of heaven. They whined and murmured about that. In fact, if you look at this particular word murmur in the New Testament dictionary, it, it says it's a word which means to say anything against anything in a low tone. Uh, you believe that? You believe what they did? Uh, you know, I've been in church a long time. And I've preached of churches, by the way. And it's inevitable that after church and preaching churches that I usually would go out and eat with people and sit down with people or be in their homes even. And it starts up almost immediately. Well, whine against the pastor, whine against the deacons, whine against the men's ministry, whine against the women's ministry, whine against the youth pastor, whine against the... And it just goes, you know, you think, my Lord, no wonder nothing gets done. If they'd spend as much time encouraging others and quit whining, revival will break out here. Revival. It'd been a historical moment in the life of the church. But we talked Proverbs. I've been teaching Proverbs on Wednesday nights and we were talking about the, uh, about a, the words of a fool, the, even when, when it's a curse against somebody, just flitter like a bird. The idea is that when a person speaks whose life and his heart is not right, you know, it, it, nobody listens to him. It's ineffectual. But the Hebrew mindset was this. That when you spoke, it was either a blessing or a curse. What's coming out of your mouth? And that it would be effectual. The problem is what Jesus was saying, thou which judges another judges not thyself. I was thinking, clearly he's saying, you're just reaping your own destruction. You start talking about others that way. Or passing your judgment, your opinion, your mindset. You think it ought to be done. You know, that doesn't mean we can't be constructive. It doesn't mean we can't be even having a, a critical mindset in the, in the context of not passing judgment, but upon helping. That's different, Amen. He said, but if you murmur against it, you're only reaping your own destruction. You're inviting your own problems. But so many people are like that. Jesus said in John 6, 43, murmur not among yourselves. I mean, that's all the word we had on it. That should do it, shouldn't it? And usually murmur not settle just with me alone. I'm going to involve somebody else because my opinion counts. <laughs> Don't they know who I am? So I'm going to let it be known. If you catch yourself after church day murmuring in low tones, check it. Check it. Best thing we can do is learn the power of our positive words and the power of our good confession and the power of giving a good report. Yeah, it may be bad, but God's big. It may look hard, but God's tougher. It may seem impossible. There are no poss impossibilities with God. It may, they may seem like a lost cause, but they're not a lost cause with God. All right? So don't pass judgment. That's not your department. Let's see what God does. Let's, you, you win by, by beginning to be the blessing. James said, 
out of the same mouth ought not come blessings and cursings. So we, we grow in this. This is an area we have to mature in our life. This is an area we grow up in. Our, in fact, our maturity level, as I said earlier, is often exposed where we really are by what comes out of our mouth. So I work on this. You work on this. We see the glory of God. Don't be whining about everything. It reminds me of the story I heard about the guy that went to the post office. He's an old man. He couldn't write anymore because his hands were way too shaky. So he got to the post office and he had a postcard that he'd bought and he really wanted to send. So he saw a young man there, you know, working on his own little cards and stuff. And he said, son, can I ask you for a favor? He said, yes, sir. I'd be glad to help. He said, I just have a couple of sentences I need to write on the back of this postcard and then address it. Would you be willing to do that for me? Uh, Yes, sir. And so he asked him what he wanted and he took the card and he, he wrote on it and dressed it in you know, a way he wanted, flipped it over and made out the note. And uh, he handed him back the card. He said, sir, uh, anything else I can do? For you? He said, no, that, that's good. And he, he looked at the card and read it, flipped it over. He said, uh, maybe you could add one more thing. He said, sure. Took it back. He said, write this. Please excuse the sloppy handwriting. Oh, man, how often we've been in that position. You know, maybe it'll be a- oh, me instead of amen. How many, and, and that's what usually works. And, and sometimes it's where we get discouraged. And I think this kind of birth to the negativity. We have served somebody and we sought to help somebody. And there really wasn't a level of appreciation. It was only kind of complaints or murmuring or criticism. And a lot of our own criticism, let me tell you honestly, where it comes from in our own life. If you find yourself a negative person a lot, but never, never been happy with anything, you know. That's you, it's probably because you have some unresolved issues in your own heart that you're going to have to lay over to the Lord. You know, you're going to have to give it to the Lord. So I'm not that kind of person. Ask your husband. <laughs> Ask your wife. How many spouses will be honest today if they're asked that question? <laughs> well, not a one. <laughs> if you are not, you know, if you've been caught in that trap, pull yourself out of there. That's not Christ Jesus, you're not the whiner. That's not the way it works. The third point, if y'all listen faster now, we'll cover it faster. Third point is we're, we're not plotters like Korah, we're promoters. All right? Korah's always plotting. had a better plan. He, like Ford, had a better idea, you know? Had his own way. It ought to be done this way. But God hadn't assigned Korah to be the leader. God hadn't raised him up to be in charge. He's just sitting around trying to give instructions, change everything, refit everything to his personal schedule and his personal life and his personal agenda. And, you know, God, God didn't have any business for that. In fact, Cor eventually dies and swallowed up and, and God, God deals with that. You, there's this play, we're not plotting against, we're working together. And clearly the Bible describes not only the church, it describes how it operates and, and how it functions and how, 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 how it's given leadership and how it's given oversight. First Peter 5, it talks about the elders which are among and their responsibility to feed the flock and to care for the flock and to shepherd the flock and to exercise over the flock, uh, uh, oversight over the flock of God. And that word is used a lot in scripture. Sometimes it's, it's, it, instead of being translated instead of uh, overseer, it's translated elder. Sometimes it's translated pastors. There's about three words in the Greek language that all mean the same thing, that God raises up leadership within the fellowship of the body of Christ. And we work in the direction and, and with, the, with the cooperation of the body of Christ. In fact, Paul wrote the church in this, the next chapter, which is really all the same letter. In chapter 11, he says, listen, there's going to have to be strife. He used the word in the New American Standard, factions. There's going to come factions that will rise among your church. He said, and it happens for a reason. Those factions arise among you so that those approved may become evident among you. What's that mean? In other words, trouble comes. You're going to find out when difficulties and crises come into a fellowship, who's really spiritual? Who has some maturity in their life? Who has the giftings and the calls of God on their life? The divisions don't come to create a strife, but it says it's in those times of difficulty that a fellowship can discover where the real maturity is and where the real immaturity is. Now, I want you to know this, this is, maturity is not an overnight thing. It's a growth process. And even these areas I'm speaking about, I want to grow in and I want to get deeper with the Lord in and I want to go further with God in. But the idea here is that God has a program already laid out. We just need to read the Bible and figure it out and respond to it faithfully and loyally and, and not be a plotter, you know, but be a promoter. We're not complaining, as I said a while ago. We're com- complimenting. And the word compliment, I mean, oh, you're wonderful. That's not what that means. It means to add to, to give value to something. 
So we want to give value to the body of Christ. We're not going to be the person who's distracting from the body of Christ. The fourth point is this. We are real, not religious. The problem in the children of Israel is you see so many of them turned out to be phonies. They really weren't people of faith. In fact, the Bible tells us in Hebrews that the reason many of them did not go in the land was because they had an evil heart of unbelief. They didn't have faith. They weren't real, genuine followers of Jehovah God. Some of them were following, just following their own agendas and were following their own plan. But the biggest thing to make the church be successful is for the real deal be real in their life. If you're truly a born again child of God, to get on board and live it fully. Don't bail out. Don't back up. Don't quit. Don't, don't be afraid with others. Just move forward. You know, you, you can never be afraid of moving forward. Now, here's the deal with the counterfeits. Paul wrote to the church in the Corinthians. He also writes them later and says, you know, you need to examine yourself to see if you're really in the faith. He said, you, want, you need to prove your own self. Peter wrote the same message in 2 Peter 1.10. He said, every one of you in the church need to make your calling and your election sure. In other words, make sure that you know that you're saved. Do you know that you know that you know you know? Amen. I know that I know that I'm saved. You say, how do you know? I just know. Well, how do you know? I, I believe what God said in his word. That if I'd repent and believe, commit my life to Christ, that he would save me. I did that. How do you know? Well, I joined the church. Uh, didn't say that. Well, you know, uh, I, I, I did that memory course at the church, you know, where I learned the church doctrine. And I learned the, 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 the statement of the, of the early century church. And so I've got that down, you know, one God and all that. I've I got that. Sorry, I didn't say that that's how, it's, that's how you get saved. Oh, Brother Joe, I, I came forward. And in fact, it was in one of your services you were preaching and I prayed a prayer. Doesn't say that. In fact, I, I remember listening to the radio this week and, I, you know, I love Christian music, but sometimes Christian DJs can be a little <laughs> short theologically. And it's one thing that Kathy and I laugh about. I call it, I call it DJ theology. And this particular DJ in their theology was talking about, they're talking about the I Can Only Imagine movie. By the way, that, that's a good movie, by the way. I, went, I mean, you got to see that. Amen. And, uh, but the, the idea behind it, you know, it's just three notes. And it's just three words will change your life. I accept Jesus. There's a lot of people who said those three words and never got saved. It's more than just three words. It's God's word and do I trust him? All right. There's no formula. Well, I did one, two, three, four. Let's see, I joined the church. I got baptized and I was sprinkled or I was confirmed or I did this. That's, there's no formula here. It's faith in Jesus Christ. That many will stand before me at the end days and they'll stand before me. They'll say, Lord, Lord. It's the right words. Did not we do many wonderful things in your name? And they give a list. And the Lord said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never. What? I never. Say, I never. Knew you. You see, it's not religion. It's a relationship. It's a commitment to Jesus Christ. You say, well, you know, I grew up in the church. Well, good. That makes you a churchian, not a Christian. All right. You can grow up in a fruit bowl, but that won't make you a banana. <laughs> you have to be born a banana to be a banana. All right. You have to be born again to be a Christian. So there's this counter, counterfeit is what's ruining the church today. See, how, how does that ruin the church? Well, you, we get people in there. They have no spiritual eyes. They have no spiritual ears. They have no spiritual bent. They have no spiritual sight. And they think everything ought to work like the, well, the corporation, the successful corporation does it this way. We're not a corporation. We're the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't work by the same principles. We don't, we don't worry about a profit and loss statement. We got nothing but profit in Jesus. All right? And the loss set, I died to myself. <laughs> and because I died to myself, I gained Christ. That's the profit. There's the loss. I ain't lost nothing, by the way, if you compare the profit. There's no comparison with me and Jesus. All right? He's everything. I was a sinner. So I got new life in Christ Jesus. So we're no longer counterfeits. We're the, we're the real deal in Jesus Christ. I would say today, if you're looking at your own experience, like it says to do in this passage of examining yourself, go back to the point, not what, not what, not what you did by some formula, even though some well-intentioned person might have led you through the formula. Where's your heart? Where, where are you in Jesus? You know, where's the relationship with Christ? Because if, if, there's, if there's no relationship with Christ then it's a counterfeit. And the Bible says, it warns over and over and over and over and over and over again. 
about counterfeits. Jesus even gave the parable of the wheat and tare, remember? Said that the enemy comes in by night and he sowed seeds among the wheat field, but the seeds were not wheat, they're tare. T-A-R-E is the word. I've shared the example before. A, a panhandle farmer told me one time when I preached this in a revival up in the panhandle, he said, we call it cheat grass. Some farmers call it other stuff. I'm trying to be nice. We call it cheat grass. He said, because it cheats you. It looks like wheat. It grows about the same rate as wheat grows up. The stalk looks like wheat, but when it gets time to bear fruit and it have the little head with all the fruit, it's not there. It doesn't bear fruit. It has no head. So, well, that's a great Jesus Jesus gave in because there's a lot of people who build the church and they're growing right along with everybody else, but they have no fruit in their life. And they have, it's because they have no head in their life, which is Jesus, by the way. He's the head. He's the Lord. We can be well-intentioned. I mean, the Bible talks about the Pharisees. They were some of those moral, decent people, for the most part, that you would meet. In fact, if you were a, a Pharisee this day that we're living in, you'd be here today. This would be your lifestyle, coming to church, being a part of what church you got going on. And you, you'd probably be real active in the ministries of the church. But it wouldn't be about Jesus. It'd be about yourself. Recognition of me. Look what I've done. Look what I've accomplished. Look who I am. You know, I've got, I've got teacher. I've got lift leader. I've got pastor in front of my name. I've got, I've got, you know, whatever it might be. I'm deacon so-and-so. It's about Jesus. It's not about you. If it gets about you, then you miss the whole reason. You know, this is for the glory of God. It's for the kingdom of God. It's to be used by God to reach a lost world. And Jesus has only delayed his coming so that we, the church, might do what he's called us to do. He, says the, he said, the field of harvest is plentiful. In other words, there's plenty of people that need to get saved. What did he say? So pray they'll get saved? No. He said, pray for laborers. Pray the church will wake up and get busy reaching the lost. Let's don't be the counterfeit. Let's don't compromise and settle for anything less than what God has. Examine your if you're in the faith and if you're not in the faith, then find out what's going on in your life and get right with God. The last point is this. We are the faith filled, not faithful. We should be faithful, but we're filled with faith. We're not the fear. The children of Israel wouldn't go into the promised land. They didn't get all the blessings of God for their life. They didn't receive the inheritance that God had for them in the land because they were afraid there were going to be battles. There were walled cities. There were giants. There were conflicts that are going to have to take place. Well, I just don't like a conflict. Listen, why don't you like a conflict? If you're a Christian, you're going to have conflicts. You're going to have a conflict with the world. You're going to have a conflict with your own conflict with the devil. It's one conflict after another conflict. Amen. It's just the way it works. We can't be afraid of conflict. We can't be afraid of the devil. We can't be afraid of the lost. Some people, they won't share their faith because they're afraid, not so much of the lost, they're afraid of what the lost might think about them. There's no place for being concerned about what the world thinks about you if you're going to follow Jesus. And so if we're going to be what God's called us to be and experience the resurrection power of Jesus in our lives and being serving in his church, then we can't let, we can't let fear fill our lives. We can't let fear grip our hearts. But you realize many times that unbelief is most of the time it's based on fear because it's what I've discovered in my own life. If it's fearful, it's usually because I'm not being faithful. I'm either going to walk in faith. Or I'm going to walk in fear. It's kind of like the, the antonym of the other. Am I going to be fearful? I know some people that, that you know, you, they're, they're not going to give no matter what you tell them to do in the church. You can preach on giving. You can talk about biblical stewardship. You can show them what the Bible has to say about proportion in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament, they're not going to buy into it. You know why? They're afraid. They're afraid they won't make it. They're afraid they won't be able to pay the bills. They've worked so hard for the money. And what, what, I need this money for this. What do you need it for? Because I need that money for this. I, I won't get by. And they, they just won't do what God leads them to do in that area of their life. And it's not because sometimes it's greed, sometimes it's stingy, but a lot of times it's just flat fear. But no matter which it is, it's still sin. Am I going to walk in unbelief? All sin is unbelief. Ultimately, that's what it really boils down to. All the sin that comes into my life is used because I'm not going to believe God somewhere in, in some area of my life. Oh, don't be so quiet. Say amen. amen. <laughs> or oh me, give me a, a, gro a groan something. Let me know you're still breathing. This message is so simple and so clear for us not to be those people to get laid. He's just given us an illustration from scripture of what happened to those folks. Let's talk about the same kind of people. They didn't go in and get what God had for them because they were afraid. Because they believed something. 
story in somebody else's report or they believe themselves. You can't listen to your own fears. You know why people don't share Christ? Fear. Why don't people give many times? It just comes down to fear. Why don't people give proportionally? It's fear. Some of you won't forgive, you know, because you're afraid. You won't forgive that person. You're afraid of letting them off the hook. You're afraid that God won't get after him when he needs to get after him. You're afraid God can't handle it right. You think you know how to handle the situation and you're going to deal with it in your own mindset. You're going to have to forgive. That is an act of faith. What, what's the, what has to do with faith? The Bible says you forgive others, you've been forgiven. That's, that's the word of God. How do, I, how do I respond to that? In faith, I forgive others. If I don't forgive, he said, how can you be forgiven? You won't forgive others or trespass against you. Not that God hasn't forgiven you. You're not going to sense the freedom in the Christian life that God wants you to experience if you're not going to forgive. You got to move in faith. Especially as a church. This church started back in 19. 85, we always tell people 88 and 89, but 85, it started in the heart. In 85 and 86, I had the courage to finally share it with my wife, <laughs> what God was starting in our heart. It started there, it's just an act of faith. God was speaking something. God began, in 1988, the door was opened. God said, this is the time, this is the moment, and we moved forward. We didn't have any money to do that. I mean, seriously, I had to do revivals and continue to do this. I, had about, I told the Lord, I'll do these last few months of crusades and revivals. And then, Lord, I'm going to do what you told me to do. We're just going to cut it off. If God doesn't, if you don't meet us here, then we just go down. By the way, I'd rather go down feeling that I was really trusting the Lord in something than to have that word to trust the Lord in something and just not do it. Yeah. That to me is a greater failure than the other failure. Yeah. It's called falling in the right direction. <laughs> And you may have to fall in the right direction in your life multiple times, but keep going forward. Yes. You're going to walk through this and you're going to experience the victory that God has for your life. Some of you are struggling with something today. You've been, you've been fighting. You're starting to get frustrated over it. Come back to this simple position. I'm going to trust God and I'm going to keep trusting God. I'm going to trust God. And if I fail in the process, I'm going to confess it. I'm going to get up and keep trusting God. Listen. You don't move anywhere if you don't believe God, if you don't have faith. And I, there's always some area in my life and always probably some area in your life the Lord's saying, trust me in this. It could be in your kids. It could be in your family. It could be in your spouse. It could be on your job. It could be here in your church. It could be in your ministries. But hey, don't bail out. If God will speak to you and he will give you clarity and he'll give you his word that will apply to your situation and you embrace that and say, I am not bailing out. I'm not going to be filled with fear. I'm going to be filled with faith and I'm going to trust God and I'm going to see God do this in my life and I'm going to give glory to God in doing it. That's how we move forward. 1988, we had the first services. And by the way, if you'll come to 101 today, or this, next week, We'll talk more about this in the class and share more about this. In fact, let me just say this real quickly about the 101. If you haven't been to 101 yet, some of you have been here for a while, haven't been to 101. You need to repent. <laughs> it's about an hour and a half. Not, and that hour and a half, you'll walk away blessed. But you, if the church is as important as the Bible says it is, then you need to find out what, what we're doing as a church. Wouldn't you agree? If the church is as important as the Bible teaches it, and be sure I will stand before God when he's going to ask me about my church and what I did. Is he going to ask every one of us about it? Amen. Because it's his bride and he wants us treating his bride right. Amen. Amen. So you be sure we're going to, this is, this is part of the final exam. All right. I'm helping you with your finals here. Find out what your church is. Find out how it began. Find out what the statements are. Find out what it believes. Find out our strength. Our vision for what God's called us to. It'll only improve God. Improve your, your blessing process in the, in the whole thing. Don't miss it. It's transformative. It'll help you. So many people, they get a part of church and they're just, what happens, they settle into mediocrity, which is called, I'm here every Sunday. Well, that's good. Praise God. If you weren't, I wouldn't have anybody to preach to. <laughs> so I'm not complaining about that. Continue to be here every Sunday. But there is a gift that God's giving you. It's a supernatural working of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And you're not going to really, really fully experience the power of God in your life until you find out what that gift is and start functioning in it. How God wants you to function in it. 
Let's, let's be excited about what God's doing. Let's not be filled with fear. Don't be afraid to step up. Don't be afraid to move forward. Don't be afraid to count for God. The Bible says in the last, that Jesus said that the church, my people, they're going to be like a city set on a hill. You know what that means? There's this platform up here called the hill and God sets us on it. And the world grows darker by every day as the Bible says, and we're that light. You say, well, my light doesn't shine very brightly. I can guarantee you, I don't care how dim your light is. If we turn all the lights off in here and it's dark, your light's going to be seen. Yeah. So it's all right to be dim lit. Just don't be dim wit. <laughs> Amen. You can shine. But the more you learn who you are in Christ, the more you're going to shine. Your life, your church is a platform to this community and the world around us. Your home is that same kind of platform. Paul put it this way. We're letters to be read of all men. We're letters to be read of all men. Now, if we, let's put that in a common vernacular. You're like a TV show being shown every week. You're like a movie. It's being witnessed. Your life is set up and God sets you. He said, you're, you're like a you're like a candle on a lampstand. You don't hide it. You don't put it under a bed. You don't put it under a bushel. It shines. It's there to shine so all can see. In other words, there's no secret service disciples, no undercover agents for Jesus. We're public. We're open. Paul said, follow me. I'm following Jesus. So we tell people, follow us. We're following Christ. But your life is that platform. Let it be what God's, God's given you that platform. Use it for the glory of God. I'm excited about what God has for us in these days ahead. I'm not planning on retiring. I'm sorry to tell you that. <laughs> you know, I'm not. You know, you probably have to shoot me to get rid of me or find somebody else to haul me off. I'm not planning on quitting. Someone said, well, if a church calls you, I said, well, if I see Jesus visibly, I'll probably respond. <laughs> but hey, as far as my life's concerned, I'm going on with Jesus. You know how long? Forever. <laughs> Forever. And no place for us to quit, bail out and say, well, I'm retired. Well, good for you. For church. <laughs> Amen. God is so good to us. I'm excited about what God's going to do. I've, I sat down at dinner with the men's ministry the other night, and just looking around the room, excited about their response to what God's going to do with our women's ministries. You know, I'm not going to be that person going to murmur about all of it. If I see something in there that needs to be found, I'll deal with it. You can deal with it. We'll talk to it. We'll deal with it. We'll encourage one another. We'll move forward with it. Amen. We'll address things. We want to be what God's called us to be, but we're going to get up and we're going to be, I'm excited about God's doing our children's ministry, our youth ministry, our worship teams. God's moving. God's working. We had 70 plus men at our men's retreat. That was phenomenal, you know, for church. Now we've got the other campus going to be opening up just soon. That's moving to the new location. You know, I saw what happened at Easter. The potential, you saw it yourself. I mean, we, we doubled attendance in one week. We could do that again next Sunday if we wanted to. We could. All you got to do is just bring one person. Just one person. You bring one person. See how simple that is? That's the whole idea of the gospel. The one tells another, another tells another, another tells another. Jesus said, go into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. I just see, I see fruit, life. I see victory. I see progress. I see growth. And I think we have such a great foundation for the future. Let's use it for the glory of God. You have a great foundation in your life, in your home. Use it for the glory of God. Don't let anything stop you from what God called you to be. Listen, it gets back to this. You're going to be a disciple, not a deserter. You're the winner. You're not the whiner. You're the promoter. You're not the plotter. Amen. You're the real. You're the religious. You're not the fearful. You're the faithful. Amen. In a message like this, I, I, God speaks to our hearts. Some people think I devised my sermons and planned my sermons to make everybody feel bad. I don't have to do that. We already feel bad enough. But I deal, will point out to where those bad feelings are coming from and how we can deal with them. Amen. The antidote is the cross of Jesus Christ. The resurrected power of Jesus in our lives. If you don't know Christ today, when I was going through that little section of the message about being counterfeit real, we need to be sure that we're sure. How, do I, how am I going to be sure? I've trusted God in his word. My faith is in him. 
If I have to stand before Jesus and he says, why should I let you in my heaven today? It's not because I was a Baptist preacher. Or I was a Baptist. Or I was a Catholic or Methodist or any other denomination. It's not going to be because, well, you know, I've preached in hundreds of churches. And I've, I've literally thousands to Jesus Christ have been saved because of my ministry. Depart from me, you work of iniquity. Anything that's not faith in Christ is iniquity. Even our good works will fail if it's not in Jesus Christ. If you're here without Jesus today, give your heart and your life to him. I want us to stand together. There'll be some men here at this altar today, including myself. If you want to come to the, either one of them and say, listen, I need to give my heart and my life to Jesus I encourage you to do that, not to put that off, not to find an excuse, but to do what you know you need to do. This is your